In the net tonight, hello Mr Chips, from metal mickeys to software agents, we report on robots and softbots. Benjamin Woolley takes a look at the edutainment market. Can software which is designed to educate and entertain really do both? In our weekly hot list, Suzanne Charlton casts a weather eye over the World Wide Web. And how sim games could beat the treasury at forecasting the economy. Someday perhaps planes will be flown by robots. This one can't fly yet, but, uh, well, what can you do? I hate to brag, but I can perform 36 separate and distinct acts. Proudly we present George, mechanical irk of the RAF Saffron Walden, brainchild of... From the dawn of the industrial age, we've dreamt of creating a new race of mechanical slaves, robots, with superhuman strength, but only enough intelligence to carry out their allotted tasks without objection. The robot also smokes in spite of the budget. But in the coming information age, physical strength and obedience won't be enough. We need a new breed of workers, not robots, but so-called dot-bots, smarter and able to work on their own, processing the tidal wave of information that threatens to engulf us. But where do we find these intelligent agents? Mr. Chips, a robot developed at Sussex University's School of Cognitive and Computing Science, is a progenitor of this new breed. Often when people think of robots, two images spring to mind. One is uh, Terminators or humanoids from, from Star Wars. And another are the kind of industrial automation arms which weld cars together in car factories. Now, the kind of robots we're interested in building are different from both of those. The world is a very complex place, and if we wanted to build a robot or a software agent which had the kind of intelligence that you might attribute to a sheepdog, that's going to be very, very hard. And the indications are that it will be at least as hard as advanced technology such as the space shuttle or building nuclear power stations. Now, one way around the, the, the problems is to build systems which can adapt to their environment or learn in some way. Mr. Chip's only purpose in life is to move around avoiding obstacles and find the center of the room. But, crucially to the idea of developing truly intelligent agents, Mr. Chip's circuits have not been designed, but evolved. I decide what it means to be fit for this species of robots. So it might be uh, keeping away from the walls and wandering around. Uh, and inside this box, there, are, there is an electronic circuit which is full of little switches which control what the components do and how they're wired up. And what happens is, initially, this electronic circuit is wired up randomly. I then try out lots of different random electronic circuits. And some of them, because they're random, will just behave slightly better according to this artificial selection of keeping away from the walls uh, that I've set up. And those will breed preferentially compared to the ones which are slightly worse at keeping away from the walls. Eventually, I will uh, evolve a way of wiring up the electronic circuit, which causes it to behave in such a way that the robot keeps away from the walls. None of the robots which we have artificially evolved do anything which is astoundingly intelligent. Typically, we've engaged them in very simple tasks, such as distinguishing between a, a paper square and a paper triangle, or trying to find their way to a light source without bumping into things. The important thing is not so much what they do, but how, how they got there. The Cox team act more like gardeners or dog breeders than programmers. These mini-robots are being developed to avoid obstacles. At first, their behavior is pretty useless, because the program controlling each robot is generated by a random string of code, robot DNA if you like. Each code sequence determines the circuitry of the central chip, different code, different circuit. So, by sheer chance, some robots perform better than others when they're tested in a software simulation complete with obstacles. The ones that navigate the simulation best are chosen as parents for the next generation. In true biological fashion, sections of parent code are mixed together and the offspring tested again. After many generations of breeding, this electronic natural selection produces robots adapted to the task in hand. 
Well, there are a large variety of tasks that an autonomous mobile robot could be put to, to, to use in. They could do security patrols, they might be able to do office cleaning, delivering packages from one side of a building to another. Then on the software side, if you think of a robot as sensing its environment and acting accordingly, then you can build software which senses the virtual environment that it's inhabiting and acts accordingly. So there could well be use for autonomous agents which perform useful tasks within software environments as well. The work at COGS is aimed at breeding smarter electronic helpers, but to see the potential of agents which never escape from the digital world, we have to look on the other side of the Atlantic, to MIT's Media Lab. Software agents are really very similar to hardware agents or robots. Um, they also try to sense their environment, but in their case the environment is of, of a very different nature. The environment is that of computer networks and they have to sense information and events that happen in computers and computer networks. We are trying to develop two types of agents. Uh, one type are software agents that help users with the complexity of the online world and the overload of information that is available on the online world. Homer is a system for music recommendation that uses a technology called social information filtering. Uh, and it just recommends music to you based on what you've specified as your preferences. So you don't say things like, I like rap music or I like house music. You say, I give this artist a seven, I give this artist a one, and it will compare you to every other user and figure out what you're most likely to enjoy and not enjoy. So let's show you what Homer can do. Uh, there are a few functions you can access from the first page. You can give it some artists that you like, and it will find artists that are most similar to those artists. And uh, there's also Homer the Dating Service, which will give you a list of your nearest neighbors. Uh, and everybody has an anonymous user ID so that privacy is not violated, but it will give you a list of their IDs and how far they are from you. So for example, if I click on this person, I can send them a little message that says, we have similar tastes, let's get together for mud or some you know, electronic chat, I don't know. Everybody wants to convey their own personality and, um, in, in the kind of car that they choose or the kind of car that they buy. And I think that similarly, um, we will have to, um, we will uh, evolve towards software that has more personality and for example, agents that have more personality so that you can buy the kind of agent which um, fits with your uh, image that you have of yourself or that you want to convey uh, to others. Silas is a virtual dog. And um, the idea behind Silas is that he's almost like a robot in which at every instant in time he's trying to figure out what the best thing to do is based on his view of the world as a dog. Okay. Hi Silas, how are you doing today? Okay Silas, are you going to show some of your tricks today? Oh, good boy, good boy. Okay Silas, you see Silas will follow me around in the world because he knows where I am from input from the vision system. And everywhere as I go, he, he follows and looks with his head. So by holding out my hand, Silas will, will sit. Now let me come over here. Come here, boy. And even though um, Silas doesn't uh, understand what I'm saying, as a matter of fact, he can't hear me. It seems natural to talk to him. But at the same time, he also has internal motivations such as his desire to play with you, or his desire to drink water, or his desire to mark the hydrant, or his desire to get, fetch a ball. And he's constantly weighing what he's seeing in the world with his internal motivations and trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. Bad boy, bad Silas. If we really uh, want to make computers that everybody, your grandmother and everybody, uh, a small child, feels comfortable interacting with, then I think it will be important that the interface becomes much more personalized and much warmer and, and much more fun. <laughs> It is understanding that sets man above the rest of sensible beings and gives him dominion over them. So wrote John Locke, the great English philosopher, 
Animal rights protesters may argue with a bit about dominion, but the search for enlightenment and understanding seems without question to be the mark of human civilization. The trouble is, understanding isn't always that easy to acquire. There's so much to read, so much to learn. But, aha, say the digital pioneers, it needn't be like that. One day, they say, you'll be able to get all of this, perhaps even all of this, onto one of these. They call it edutainment, an ugly term but an attractive theory. The idea is that the power of personal computing, multimedia, interactivity and all the other bells and whistles of digital technology can turn education into entertainment. This is more than a matter of putting reference works on CD-ROM and adding a few pictures and sounds. It's a matter of matching the way we learn to the way we think. It's also a matter of marketing. These products, promise the manufacturers, will teach the kids and keep them quiet. For most parents, that's an irresistible combination. In my day, of course, we used to make our own edutainment. We didn't have any of this fancy multimedia stuff. But we did have this, magazines like Tell Me Why. When I was 11, Monday mornings were illuminated by this wonderful magazine's stirring stories and handsome graphics. The communications satellite. Donald Campbell, the man who lived for speed. The story of milk. Captain Scott, the heroes of the Antarctic. Magazines like this gave a picture of the world so enticing, so adventurous, you just yearned to go out and live in it. There's the same sense of adventure in many of the edutainment titles of today. They promise to take you on a trip through the human body, the animal kingdom, time, space and beyond. But it all begins in a much more homely place, in little PB Bear's bedroom. They start them young in edutainment. This title squarely aimed at pre-literate toddlers. American ones in the case of this prototype. Hello, PB Bear. More British accents still in development. It's from Dorling Kindersley, a London-based publisher famous for its illustrated books and one of the pioneers in the field of edutainment, a field which, incidentally, Britain has something of a lead. You basically have a picture book that sings and dances, offering the eager parent or precocious infant the chance to explore the links between text, sound and pictures. At this level, the lines between learning and play are already blurred, so it is, in a sense, easy to claim that the title edutains. Higher up the age scale, the lines become more distinct, so the attempt to blur them is harder to pull off. Goodbye! For example, just because it comes on a CD-ROM, the leather-bound feel of Alice in Wonderland is bound to arouse the deepest suspicions of your average Nintendo-hardened burger-munching brat. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, this conspicuously isn't. However, if they can just be persuaded past the packaging, they'll find a satisfying combination of straightforward text with just enough interactive stimulation to lure even the most reluctant reader into turning the page. Uncle Archibald perhaps more successfully blurs the lines in the sense that it really is difficult to tell whether it's supposed to be good for you or just fun to play. Titles like these really are a new amalgam, one in which even the parent would be hard pushed to tell where the learning stops and the fun begins. As they reach the age of adolescence, exams and homework, the kids can embark on more active learning adventures. The titles are more overtly educational, but they compensate by being beautiful to look at and fun to explore. Fish. For example, in the Eyewitness Encyclopedia of Nature, every inquiry turns into a voyage of discovery as you point and click your way from one topic to the next. The 3D body adventure feels more like fun, but even the Disneyland rides around the skeleton and the inner ear still provide a genuine insight into human physiology. At the adult level, the idea of edutainment starts to break down. The boxes get bigger, the subjects more specialist. Take the Dead Sea Scrolls Revealed, for example. 
all this packaging and all you get inside is just a registration card, the CD-ROM and this tiny vial of what this certificate assures you to be a sample of authentic Qumran sand. The software itself is more substantial, providing access to hundreds of little video clips and pictures about the discovery and deciphering of these mysterious ancient scrolls. It's solid stuff, but after the children's titles, you feel that the sense of fun has gone. Hello, I'm Christopher Lee. Welcome to Ghosts. Betiscombe Manor is quiet these days. But it was not always so. Adult titles can also have a rather aimless quality to them, a product of so slavishly following the principles of interactivity, which state that the user must at all times be left to his or her own devices. No structure is to be imposed, no slant or story is to be added. So in a title like Ghosts, which admittedly has excellent graphics and some intriguing material, it's easy to end up feeling lost. There is, of course, that other troubling question. Can there really be so much educational gain without the usual amount of intellectual pain? Surely learning's got to hurt, if only just a little. Well, according to John Locke at least, not necessarily. Those ideas which naturally at first make the deepest and most lasting impression, he wrote, are those which are accompanied by pleasure or pain. Well, we all know about the pain. Perhaps edutainment means we can experience a bit more of the pleasure. And these two centres, if you wondered about... This cloud and any rain really only likely in the extreme east. Hi, I'm Suzanne Charlton and I'm a BBC weather presenter and this is my hot list. People do now expect it to be right and they are more disappointed when the forecast doesn't quite turn out the way that it was supposed to. We don't like getting it wrong and, and there have been improvements, particularly on this sort of looking two or three days ahead. As for sort of double checking on stories, I mean, we might get a story in from the wires, then we can maybe go into the internet and, and double check on, on stuff that's coming in. We're looking at not just being somebody who's looking at other people's uh, information that, that's, that's on the internet, but actually being there ourselves. We're setting up a worldwide weather forecasting service that people will be able to have a look at and see what we say is going to happen all around the world. A lot of the information that's on uh, the net at the moment is American or North American. This is the, the weather net. It's a good starting point and it's got quite a, a variety of things that you can get to within this. It's fairly self-explanatory. We're going to the weather cams. So, here we are. It's so great. I mean, and during the winter, if you could actually look at that and see it was snowing, or when things started to melt, you could start to see the snows receding up the hills. So this is the sort of thing that will be pushed out by the Met Service in the States and that would be picked up by the local radio and TV and broadcast as relevant in their area. Now this is when uh, may maybe the internet's really coming into its own, you know. Suddenly you've got to dash off if you're lucky enough to another part of the world. So let's say we're all having to fly off to Atlanta. We can find out what it's like there at the moment. And there we are. There's a rather interesting little bar graph, really, I suppose. Sweden this time. And a uh, five-day forecast. Just a short snippet about the weather expected in 450 different cities around the world. So let's see what's going on. Meteo France. Shall we have a look? And take a look at what's happening today. Well, we can see where the cloud is and where the sun's shining, basically. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. That's what we're looking at. A uh, swirl of cloud out across the southern North Sea. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. The government raises interest rates twice in one day to 15%. In the next 120 minutes, Britain's oldest merchant bank will be bought or go bust. 
Whatever happens in the next critical hours, the reputation of the City of London will again find itself in the spotlight. There seems a world of difference between The City and SimCity, the million-selling computer game where we get to play God, building a city from farmhouse to metropolis. In SimCity, we are in charge, controlling the development of our own little world, which is very comforting, because despite the claims of economists, predicting the fate of the real world seems more difficult than ever. But perhaps this isn't a coincidence. Some people think traditional economics is dead and could be replaced by more complex versions of Sim games. Economics makes claims to be a truly scientific discipline and on the basis of its so-called scientific findings offers policy prescriptions to governments. Its prescriptions are those of the free market, of privatisation, of deregulation and of liberalisation. And these prescriptions have been tried with a vengeance uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. Yet when we look behind the assumptions of economic theory, we see a world which is so bizarre as to be virtually unrecognisable uh, in the real world. Economic theory treats the whole world as a market, a theoretical market where everyone is engaged in trading goods and services. In this fantasy, everyone has the same information and nobody is more important than anyone else. There are no Microsofts or General Motors. Ormrod believes economics is dead because its market model bears little resemblance to the real world. Here on the trading floor of the London Metal Exchange is one of the few places in the world which bears the remotest resemblance to the precepts of free market economic theory. But even here, uh, the requirements of theory are by no means completely satisfied. Information is being exchanged on a very limited number of prices indeed. Conventional economics sees the economy just like a machine, like this car in fact. Turning the steering wheel in a particular direction, pressing on the accelerator in a particular way, will deliver an entirely predictable and comprehensible response. But in reality, the economy is much more like a complex living organism. The same stimulus, the same prod, in different circumstances, will lead to entirely different reactions. Modelling animal behaviour requires a completely different type of mathematics from the mechanical models used in classical economics. Maths too difficult to solve without advanced computer simulation. The flocking of birds, for example, looks complex but can be realistically simulated by using a few fundamental rules. The non-linear maths that produces these realistic models of animal behaviour is also the secret ingredient of simulation games, giving that feeling of being alive. And some economists believe this secret ingredient can solve the dead end of economic theory. Well, this is a preliminary model of, of Brussels. Um, what it's displaying are the different zones in Brussels. And it's got the kind of occupation of these zones uh, by uh, blue-collar residents, white-collar residents. Um, we've got transportation links in it. It's got trams and buses and roads and uh, trains and so on. And uh, we can simply explore how Brussels evolves uh, as a system under various scenarios. I would prefer to call it a simulation because I'm in a sense not pretending that I can predict with some theoretical method uh, where this is going to. I run it. I have to run it in order to see where it's going to. It's that unpredictability that provides the fascination of sim games. The challenge for the games designer is the same as for the economist, turning real-world data into a simulation that will run. Well, Simal is a game in the SimCity tradition that makes you into a governor of a developing country um, in an island. And this is the island on the screen. Um, and as governor, you have to constantly make choices that force you to weigh up the balance between economy and, co and ecology. Um, and that is the central strategic dilemma of the game. Our researcher was Jason Gaythorn Hardy, and he took um, his sort of understanding of the, f the forest and also the research that he did and turned it into a series of um, descriptions of ecological niches and also economic objects and their relationships one to another, which we then turned into a mathematical model called a cellular automaton. And Peter Allen is also trying to simulate the problems of the developing world. This is a model of Senegal, which um, combines together economic variables 
and environmental factors, natural resource availability, things like uh, soil conditions and water availability and so on, all combined in a single model, if you like, um, where each zone is in a sense treated separately but interacts with the other zones. So it's actually running along, giving us the changes in the numbers of jobs and so on in Senegal and in the different regions. But of course we can, um, we can uh, build a road, we can zoom in for example. So of course we can do runs with the new road, without the new road, and then we can compare the difference. So we know how much a road will cost, but in this way we might be able to assess how much the road does for Senegal in fact. I think that the important thing that computer games simulations can do for, for people is they can let people visualise what's going on, they can visualise the models. And so when you see something happening that doesn't correspond to a, what you expect, you go, hang on, that's not right. Why is that, why is that clump of trees falling down? I don't know why that is. But if you build a dam upstream and it disappears, well, you, you, you can see cause and effect. It has to be realised that obviously SimCity and Sim Isle and so on do not have the real complexity underneath them. Uh, but I think they, they would give people a, a real a taste and an understanding uh, for this way of looking at the world. I wonder if, and this is, this is a very wild supposition, but if you took a treasury model or an EEC model of, of some economy and you turned it into a map and you had factories appearing on the map and you had money moving around in some sort of graphical representation, I mean, it's very far-fetched, very difficult to visualise that, whether in fact people might get a much better understanding about what was going on and be able to debug the model better. Everybody understands today that an aircraft simulator is very useful to training pilots and a pilot has several hundred people aboard so we worry about that very much but of course uh, politicians are also piloting something uh, which has many millions of people aboard and the question is where is the simulator if you like that allows them to practice thank you very much for more information about internet access providers and details of a BBC educational video about the internet, send a large stamped addressed envelope to The Net, PO Box 7, London W5, 2GQ. Next week in The Net, control the horizontal and the vertical on our interactive robot, and the mysterious Michael Strangelove's plans for worldwide domination. And finally, from the net. Technosphere is a virtual 3D world that runs over the internet. It's made up of fractally generated terrains and inhabited by artificial life forms. If you design a creature, it will communicate with you by sending you email messages, it'll send you 2D pictures and QuickTime movies to show you its latest appearance and location in the world. The Technosphere website will be running from September the 1st and we really hope you'll contribute a digital beastie.